Welcome and good evening. My name is Serge Permakov, 2015 alumnus of the NYU Stern School of Business and an executive committee member of the Alumni Council. I'm excited to be here with you tonight for this exciting program. It is my pleasure to introduce a member of the Stern family, Professor Scott Galloway, in conversation here tonight with Stephanie Rule. Professor Galloway is an NYU Stern professor of marketing and teaches brand strategy class in this very room to MBA students. He's also the founder of several firms, including L2, Red Envelope, and Profit, and also has served on the boards of companies such as Gateway Computer and the New York Times. Tonight, we're here to discuss his new book, The Algebra of Happiness. <laughs> The book explores some of the topics that you might have uh, heard of if you were a, a student in his class. The topics include distilling the formula of a life well lived, striving for work-life balance and a meaningful career, and how it's so important to never, ever be late to his class. <laughs> <laughs> Joining him this evening is Stephanie Rule, MSND, MSNBC anchor and NBC News correspondent, and previously a managing editor from Bloomberg Television and editor-at-large at Bloomberg News. <laughs> Professor Galloway's book, The Algebra of Happiness, was published by Portfolio Penguin last week and is sure to be a hit with readers looking to solve the happiness equation for themselves. And at this time, allow me to turn over the stage to Professor Galloway and Stephanie Rule. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, congratulations. Uh, first of all, do you fill this room? How many students are in your class? Uh, no. Yeah, oh, so. you are about to be super amazing to me. Yeah, yeah, but about no. is the operative term there. My class is in 260, so it's 120 to 180 students, but I've taught uh, 4,200 students are created approximately $28 million in free cash flow for NYU. There you go. Um, all right, let's talk about the book. Right now, there are lots of books out about fury, rage, yep. anger, revenge, conspiracy. And uh, in large part, we're seeing the, um, the divide, the anger being capitalized upon. You've gone the reverse. Even though you're, you're an outspoken, critical guy, yep. you decided to write about happiness and fulfillment yep. at a time when more and more people feel neither. Uh, so first off, thanks for doing this. Thank uh, you. Stephanie's very busy and did this as a, a personal favor, so, so thank you. Um, so the, the process or the catalyst or the motivation for this is I look at my blessings and I look at my mood and my sister kind of summed it up. I speak to my sister every Sunday night, and a couple years ago she said to me, she's like, just hold on a second. She's like, why are you so pissed off all the time? <laughs> and it kind of, it stilled me. She said, she said, you have less reason or justification to be pissed off than anyone I know, and yet you're pissed off all the goddamn time. And I started thinking about if your blessings are here and your general mood and demeanor is here, that's a problem. And so I set about thinking about this. And then the process for books is really straightforward for me. The second most popular session in my course is the four, or I look at these four big platforms. And then do a video. Video got a million views, write a book. The book did well. And then the most popular session is something I've done the last two years. And it's the last session where I try to distill observations. Uh, personal stories and some research down to a series of best practices because I think most of the kids here, when I say kids, I mean the students, they come here thinking they're here to establish the domain expertise and the currency in the professional world such that they can develop economic security for them and their families. But I think the real reason we're here is we want to figure out a way to build meaningful lives. And the last session is basically, all right, what are best practices and worst practices around this as someone who thinks about this and it's sort of a personal journey. Uh, did a video, video got two million views. Book, there we are. But isn't one of the issues that happiness sounds simple, but yep. in fact it's very abstract. So yep. when you don't have all those blessings, it's easy to say I'm not happy because I don't have. 
right? So, you know, you've got the, the Cosmo magazine checklist yep. and you can say, oh, well, I'm miserable, but I'd be happy if I had an apartment. I'd be happy if I had a better job. I'd be happy if I got married, if I had a baby. Yep. When you talk about blessings, when you can line up all those blessings and you have them, and yet you're still sad, you're desperately more sad because those two don't even up. Yeah, and to be clear, the title's a bit of a misnomer and misleading because it connotes- That's a good idea. Uh, yeah, right, a bad title. Thank you for that. <laughs> we're close, but we're not that close. Anyways, the algebra, there is no equation for happiness. There's best practices and worst practices, but there is no one formula. Okay, so right there, when your yep. sister says, how could you have all these blessings and be angry? Yeah. Well, the two aren't connected. Well, so there are, but there are what I would call best practices. And also, happiness is probably the incorrect word, because happiness is a sensation. You can get happiness from Netflix, Chipotle, or Cialis. That will bring you short-term <laughs> happiness. What we're really talking about here is where you make investments across your life and the decisions you make and the kind of personal code you have such that you can develop an arc or you can develop a plane where the highs and lows of life, which happen to all of us, are just swinging on a higher plane. And I think there are a series of best practices and a lot of research to show those be that best practice. So you talked about when something bad happens to you. Martin Seligman just published some research, and I don't know if anyone saw this, but it really that kind of stilled me. One year out from winning the lottery, people are no more happier or less happy. You know all those articles that say, oh, everyone's depressed and suicidal after they won the lottery? That's not true, but they're not any happier. They usually, on average, regress to about where they were before they won the lottery. That's interesting, but what's fascinating is that the same is true of people who have been in an accident and are paralyzed. A year post the accident, they are actually no less or more happy than they were previous to the accident. And that is, our brains, when they recognize a pattern, adapt to it and regress to a certain level of happiness. And so the one thing, though, that tends to create variance in your life, and I think a decent analysis is fitness. So everyone's talking about functional fitness right now. And one of the keys to fitness is shocking and surprising the body. And that's doing something different. Because if you do the same things over and over, your body adapts to it and just moves to the same level of strength or fitness. And the only thing that's sort of unpredictable and can create a higher plane consistently over the course of your life is investing and in informing new relationships because people are unpredictable. And they will surprise and disappoint you, but that is the equivalent of kind of varied fitness that takes you to a higher plane, uh, is, is in fact relationships. Then I guess you shouldn't be a marriage counselor. Yeah, no. I mean, Number two. <laughs> um, <laughs> My dad's had four, but we think this one's going to stick. <laughs> but is that one of the issues, the way we look at happiness yep. or even the idea of being in love? Yep. Those are not sustainable beings, right? It's more like adrenaline rushes or being drunk or high. You say that like it's a bad thing. Um, so, <laughs> well, there's a lot there. So let, me, listen, let me move. You don't expect to be drunk or yeah. high or high on adrenaline all the time, you know going in, it's a rush and it's gonna be over in a little while. But we enter into our life phases, yep. assuming this feeling of happiness, yeah, it should exist it forever should more. It should sustain, so. Which is why, you know, and then you can connect that to how people feel about their jobs, their yep. marriage, yep. parenthood. So you brought, let's talk about marriages and relationships and work. So, and I'll this sort of ease into some of the uh, equations. So what is, I ask the kids in the class, what is the most important decision they'll make in terms of their happiness over the course of their life? And because it's in the context of a business school class, they go, what industry you'll go into? And then someone else goes, no, it's the arc of the industry you're going into. Is it in decline or ascent? Is it your job position? Where you'll live? Someone goes soulful and it's like where you live or being near your family. The most important decision you'll make is who you partner with the rest of your life, specifically your spouse specifically who you decide to have kids with. And there are three components, uh, if you look at most of the research, that sustain a uh, productive long-term uh, relationship. The first is physical attraction, sex and affection, identify your relationship as singular and say, I choose you. The second is values, how close are you gonna live to his or her parents? What's the role of religion in your lives? What role does politics play? Where do you expect to live over the long-term? And then the third is one that people don't talk about because it's crass, especially young people, when they're thinking about committing to this important partnership. 
And that is money. And specifically, your approach to money, what economic weight class you expect to be in, who's responsible for that weight class, and what is each of your approach to spending. And a lot of that is the number, people think the number one source of divorce is some sort of value shift or infidelity. It's not. It's agita and disagreement over money. So you need to have these very open and honest conversations up front. Because quite frankly, the thing that can take you off track most in your 20s and 30s, everyone in this room may not feel it, but you're already kind of in the top 10% economically relative to the majority of the pop population. The majority of you are healthy. The majority of you have more opportunities than 99% of the global population. The thing that can really take you off track economically and emotionally in your 20s and 30s, people say, oh, a sickness. The reality is most sickness is uh, of the aged. Very few people in their 20s and 30s get sick. What can really take you off course in your 20s and 30s and 40s, quite frankly, is making a bad decision around a partner, and that is divorce. Divorce is economically ruinous. It sets people back emotionally and psychologically several years. So this upfront analysis of who you're going to partner with is really important. At the same time, well, Scott, you're saying be so choosy. What if you don't end up with a partner? It's also important. We talk about investing. And that if you want outsized returns, you have to take outsized risks. I think the same is true in relationships. You have to take outsized risks to get punch above your weight class and find someone more interesting than you. Everybody wants to punch up. Evolutionary desire is that I want to marry someone smarter, stronger, faster, nicer, better character. That is a healthy part of evolutionary progress. And the way you get there is no different than a hedge fund manager. If you want to punch into a higher weight class than you deserve, economically, professionally, or with relationships, you have to be willing to take a risk. That means going up to strangers and introducing yourself, pushing yourself to be in social situations, asking people out for coffee. Nothing wonderful will ever happen to you, I mean really wonderful, without taking um, an uncomfortable risk. It's the same as managing a hedge fund. I got a little bit off track there. But no, you're, 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 you're saying take an outsized risk and yep. put yourself out there, but at the same time, you need to be brutally honest when choosing a partner so you can figure yep. out if you're compatible. Yep. Isn't it hard to do both? Because if you're taking an outsized risk, chances are you're kind of bullshitting. Yeah, but when I say take an outsized risk, I mean have, put yourself in front of more opportunities. Um, if, you find somebody, if you find somebody who's with somebody who is just in a different weight class from character, looks, success, and you think, how did that happen? One of two things happened. Either one person is much richer than the other, or two, that other person was willing to take risks and was willing to endure rejection. One of the keys, and this is another, um, this is another, I think, critical algorithm. Your success is a function of your, pers your resilience over failure. Say Full that stop. again. Say that your again. success, is a, your level of success is a function of your, res of your perseverance over your failure. I have been, I've had marriages fail, I've had businesses go bankrupt. Law, er, everybody in this room will know failure. Everybody will lose somebody they love. Everybody knows tragedy. Your ability to mourn and to move on is key to success. I am three, four, and two. I've started nine businesses. I am generously three, four, and two, which means I've had four businesses fail and two just go mad. If you don't take advantage of the greatest experiment in the history of mankind, and that is the US economy, people say we embrace failure. That's bullshit. We don't embrace failure, but we tolerate it. If I lived in Europe or I lived in China, I would not be here, because those economies do not tolerate what failure the way mean, we do. What does that mean, take advantage of the US economy? Because when you say that sure. to a room of bright-eyed young people like this, I, I think on one hand, they feel inspired, and on the other hand, they feel stressed by it. And then they walk out going, well, I'm, I, I'm not taking, yeah, am I taking advantage of it? Yeah, I'm paying NYU tens of thousands of dollars for the rest of my life. So you can be more risk aggressive around starting your own businesses, around putting yourself in situations to meet other people, around going on social media. We tolerate risk and failure better than any society in the world. The other thing is going back to education, another algorithm. Give me someone's credentials and your zip code, and I can tell you how much money you're going to make. 
Someone who went to Dartmouth and is living in New York is going to be making at least $150,000 by the time they're 30. Someone who dropped out of high school and is living in Little Rock will be lucky if they're making $50,000. Credentials and zip code. We live in a caste society in America. We don't like to think we're in a caste society. We are 100% in a caste society. And the new determinants of that caste are higher education universities. Full stop. This used to be the upward lubricant of upward mobility. We've now thrown sand in the gears because people like myself have become drunk with exclusivity and no longer think we're public servants. We think we're luxury brands. And we brag about how hard it is to get in here. We brag that it's, we reject 90% of the people who apply. That's like a housing shelter taking pride in the fact they take 90% of the people who need housing and shoo them off. The unremarkables, I'm going way off track here. The unremarkables <laughs> no longer have access to, to incredible, incredibly remarkable opportunity, and it's called higher education. Your zip code and your credentials. So even despite the cost here, even at a place like NYU, despite the incredible cost, college is still a really good plan B. I get people who come up to me at conferences all the time and say, my kid's thinking of dropping out of school. She's really into programming. And they say, Maybe she'll be the next Mark Zuckerberg. I'm like, assume your child is not Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> and, uh, even, and what we have done as drunken pigs at the trough in academia is we have starched a lot of the return out with higher, ed higher fees, but the return is still dramatically pos positive. Get to a city. Credentials, college isn't for everyone, so get an esthetician license, a class three driver's license, a guild, union, whatever it might be, union card. The second thing is zip code. Two-thirds of the economic growth over the next 30 years is going to be in 20 super cities around the nation, and most of you could probably name 18 of them. You want to get to a city while you're young, because once you start collecting dogs and kids, it gets very hard I'm to stay in the you. city. I'm going to interrupt you. Why? Please. But, but if this is about the algebra of happiness, yeah. why is that the formula for happiness? Because to move to New York City, to go to Dartmouth and walk out of Dartmouth in student debt and move to New York City, yep making 150 grand, I don't know, that's kind of like standing outside the world's most fun party. And if you were making 50 grand yep. and were not saddled with student debt and you know, living yep. you know, in Boulder, Colorado, I don't know, one could say that, that you might be a, a whole lot happier because what I first established was like the epicenter of living a fear of missing out life. So, great point. So the first is, let's talk about the relationship between money and happiness. When I query my kids how much money they expect to be making, and I have a selection bias, I want to first acknowledge your point, that the path to happiness doesn't involve necessarily making a shit ton of money. There are a lot of people who don't make a lot of money and at a young age decide that's not their priority, they adjust their lifestyle, and they live very happy lives. That is not the cohort I'm teaching. <laughs> the, cohort, the cohort I am teaching when I ask them how much money they expect to be making in 10 years, not only do most of them think they're going to be in the top 10%, 90 plus percent of them think they're going to be in the top 1%. So the first thing is, if you expect to be in the top 10 or 1%, here's a myth. It's called the myth of balance. Expect to have no balance in your life. We all know somebody who's good looking, in great shape, great relationship, gets along with their parents, donates time at the ASPSCA, and has a food block. Again. <laughs> Assume you are not that person. If you expect to be professionally successful and in that weight class economically, assume that you're going to spend most of your 20s and 30s working and not much else. I'm not here with a message of hope. Secondly, the relationship, hold on, let me finish your question. The relationship, before you punch holes in everything I've been living for. The, the relationship between money and happiness, OK? There's a relationship. People who are middle class people are happier than poor people, and affluent people are happier than middle class people. But here's the thing it tops out. It tops out once you get to a point where you can afford a nice house, good education, you can absorb an economic shock, you're not worried about health care. Supposedly, in most cities in America, that's between $90,000 and $150,000 a year. In Manhattan, I think it's about $750,000 a year. <laughs> But this is the thing you have to realize, is that once you get to that point of some level of economic security, I think you need to realize that money is a wonderful thing. Bust a move to economic security. We live in a capitalist society. It is really important. But once you get to that point, realize that money is the ink in your pen. It can make your stories burn brighter. It can write different chapters. But it is not your story. 
if you keep imagining more and more money will make you exponentially more happy, you're going to be disappointed. So get to that point, but then realize it flatlines. I'm sorry, Steph. We're te you're telling young people, take these massive risks. On some level, is it? With relationships, not necessarily professionally. But even professionally. Yeah. We're, we're giving this advice, yep. put yourself out there, yep. and are we doing it at the risk of people not respecting what it means to just grind it out anymore, right? So let me give you an example. Yep. When you were in your 20s and I was in my 20s, we just grind. That's all we did. We weren't yep. asking, how do I feel about working for the man? Like, do, yep. what, you know, am I, am I unleashing my animal entrepreneurial spirit? We were just yep. grinding it out and working. Yep. And to the point that you said just a moment ago, you know, should my daughter leave school? Maybe she's the next Mark Zuckerberg. Yep. When you leave here, four people are going to come up to you and say, like, I'm really looking for a mentor because I read a book and yeah. I heard mentorship is where it's at. Yeah, answer is no. <laughs> okay, so right there. But, but, yeah. but that's it right there. So I want you to help, help drill down a little bit so mm -hmm. people understand when you say take an outsized risk. Yep. Sometimes that gets misconstrued for people who are saying, I shouldn't be here just working. I'm a thinker. And they're doing it before they're grinding all of those hours that you need to create that stable network. To the point of the, yep. the, I mean, it's like, yes, maybe Scott will be your mentor or maybe you're gonna win Powerball, but wouldn't it be better to just work? So uh, let me be clear. Uh, taking outsized risks in terms of introducing yourself, being open to new relationships, I think that's where you wanna be risk aggressive. Let me talk about entrepreneurship and let me talk about the work in your 20s. You and I both started in investment banking. You were on the trading side. I was, I, the only real job I had was at Morgan Stanley. The worst advice you will ever hear in this chair, and you'll hear it every week during your entire business school career, is the following. We invite two types of people to universities to speak or business schools. Super interesting and successful people are billionaires. For some reason, we've decided that billionaires just have insight around life. And they oftentimes finish their conversation with what I think is some of the worst advice given to young people. Does anyone want to guess what it is? Follow your passion. What utter bullshit. <laughs> if someone tells you to follow your passion, it means they're already rich. <laughs> and typically, the guy on stage telling you to follow your passion made his billions in iron ore smelting. <laughs> this is your job. Your job is to find something you're good at and then spend the thousands of hours and apply the grit and the perseverance and the sacrifice and the willingness to break through hard things to become great at it. Because once you're great at something, the economic accoutrements of being great at something, the prestige, the relevance, the camaraderie, the self-worth of being great will make you passionate about whatever it is. No one grows up thinking, I'm passionate about tax law. But the best tax lawyers in this nation fly private and have a much broader selection of mates than they deserve. And they get to do, <laughs> then they get to do interesting things, which, by the way, makes them passionate about tax law. And here's, here's the problem with believing you should follow your passion. Work is hard. And when you run into obstacles and you face injustice, which is a common guaranteed attribute of the workplace, injustice, you'll start thinking, I'm not loving this. This is upsetting and hard. It must not be my passion. That is not the right litmus test. Do your passions on weekend. Be a DJ. Jay-Z followed his passion and is a billionaire. Again, assume you are not Jay-Z. Back to you. You mentioned balance before. Should we stop talking about it, especially in rooms like this? And when we're talking about career and life success, chances are the people who are in this room never had balance to begin with, mm -hmm. right? If you're, a, if you're an overachiever, you, were, you never got an A on a test or, or became student council president and was like, oof, I'm all set, now I can just chill. Immediately, those people are going, what's next, what's next? Yeah. Because the people you're talking about, in large part, are, are success monsters and adrenaline addicts. Yeah. So, is the, so is the idea to, to seek balance a mistake in and of itself? Because the idea of balance, none of those people ever wanted to be balanced in a race. They wanted to win it. Yeah, yeah. So there's some, 
you know, high achievers that are just always on the wheel and always maniacally focused on success their whole lives. I think most of us do at some point want some balance. And the, the conversation I just think people need to have with yourself is just an open and honest one, and that is, I have a lot of balance now. I have a lot of balance. I'm not a uh, workaholic. I level, uh, anyone here who works with me will attest that, yeah, we, we do all this shit, and he just takes the credit. But <laughs> I have a lot of balance now because I didn't have much when I was younger. There's just no getting around it to attain a certain level of success. I think you're going to have to sacrifice for at least a couple, a couple decades. But I do think at some point, you know, it, I think it depends on what kind of person you are. But my sense is, at least following your Instagram feed, it seems like you have a lot of balance. You're very good at it. Um, at, and it at a cost, though. Right? It does I mean, come at a cost. If you think about any sort of traditional jobs and success, yeah. Right when when work was created or business, it was sort of this assumption that the executive, yep. their only job in the world was to work. Yep. And and there was an idea that, and they didn't necessarily talk about it, that there was another person, i.e., a wife, who ran everything else in their life. They weren't yep. responsible for anything. Yep. So now that we are we are we are more evolved. When you're with your sons, yep. you don't say to me, Steph, I'm babysitting. You're, you say. I'm taking care of my children. Yep. Now that we have become more evolved and we're seeking balance, does that work in any sort of traditional work or life environments? I feel like these are, I, the answer is I don't know. Um, but how do we evaluate it? So look, I, I think you have to decide, and so let me go back to happiness. In general, people are, um, the people who are happiness, happiest are typically in monogamous relationship and have families. And that requires a certain level of sacrifice and it requires a certain level of forgiveness. By the way, one of the key components to any long-term relationship. I want you to say that one more time. I, what, which part? It, here's why. No, but I think okay. it's so important yeah. because the idea of ha people often think about happiness as, it's th as, as this nirvana, yeah. right? You're monogamous, right? Yeah. And so I'm monogamous, which means I must be madly in love, right? I have a family, which means my kids must be wonderful. But you just said, be monogamous. You have to sacrifice. There's some level of balance. There's some level of sorrow. Those are words that people don't normally assimilate with happiness. So I think it's really important for you to say it again. So I'm quoting research, and I don't want to be too judgmental here. I'm just saying that in general, the happiest cohorts have, a, these are best practices tend to be in monogamous relationships where they have built a sense of support. A lot of people argue that the baby boomers saw, most people see marriage as a commitment. The baby boom generation came along and saw marriage as an enhancement. And the moment it stopped becoming an enhancement to their lives, divorce rates skyrocketed. Family is just kind of critical to, to everything. I mean, you, there's very few people, especially among males, life expectancy goes down seven to nine years when you um, are not living with other people when you're a male. Because, the, again, the key to everything is are you helping the species? And the brain has an unbelievable low, you know, kind of low resolution security camera trying to decide if you're adding value to the species. So when you exercise, you're fooling the brain into thinking that you're building housing or hunting prey. And it decides to keep you around a little bit longer. When you are really engaged in work or doing a crossword puzzle, the brain, the low security camera, is fooled into believing that you're making important decisions for the clan or the tribe or the group, and it decides to let you stick around. The most important thing, the hands down, the most important act that literally releases a hormone that clears out the bad cholesterol is, in a word, caregiving. Caregivers, new mothers do not die. The moment your parents move in with you, your life expectancy goes up two years. People who are actively- Your misery goes up 20%. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> At 100%. Now you get to live longer. That's it's right. Worse. But, you're, yeah. but, you're, but it's awful. Who want to kill me now? <laughs> but, but people, it makes sense, right? This, this is the bottom line. The universe wants to prosper. The universe chooses prosperity and evolutionary progress. So what does it do? It creates a series of incentives around what makes the universe prosper. So food, that, food is fun. We need that. Sex is fun. The species needs that, right? Ultimately, the most important thing to the well-being of the species comes down to having an irrational passion for someone else's well-being. 
If we woke up tomorrow and decided we didn't just are, weren't infinitely in love with these little things called children, no one would put up with that shit. No one. You'd literally have the end of the species in about 20 to 40 years. So the universe chooses prosperity. So the people who go all in, I mean, really go all in, and decide that they're going to find relationships in their life where they care for that person irrationally, they don't keep score. They're going all in on that person's well-being. Those people are rewarded with a level of contentment, a level of satisfaction, a notion and a knowledge that their blink is still a blink in the cosmic universe, but their blink matters. The happiest people have a preponderance and they over-index, not on transactional relationships. A lot of people are in marriages where you've split up, you split up the household like a corporation and you're all managing different parts. It's not even kids where there's an instinctive, but they've decided that they're going to create a group of people where they go all in, don't keep score, and become irrationally passionate about other people's beings. The matriarch and the patriarch of elephant herds and mammals are typically chosen by whoever demonstrates care, affection, and protection for someone else's children because they're seen as stronger. The universe wants to prosper. So, and I know this sounds very Oprah, but the people who consistently over-index in, hap in happiness are the ones that have one thing in common. They have taken an irrational interest in the well-being of other people, regardless of what they're getting back in terms of what we think of traditional return on investment in relationships. In terms of prosperity, then, if that's what we want to do as a society and culture and as individuals, even if we're not consciously deciding it, Take me to 20-year-olds who are getting ready to go out, right? right? A group of guys and a group of girls. Those group of guys are sitting around talking, going, I hope I get laid tonight. Does this connect with? I love that you can say that. Yes, I can. I love that you can. can say that. Guess what? You can. Let's see how okay. it goes for yeah. you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right? So those guys are saying, I want to get laid tonight. Right. Because in prosperity, yeah. deep inside of us, is yeah. it, I want to go spread my seed. And women, yep. those same 20-year-old girls, whether it's, good or bad, are saying, I really like this guy. You know, I'm, I'm going to be sure I don't sleep with him because you know, I, I like him. Uh, and I want to go out with him again. Is it this idea that if she wants to be prosperous, she needs to protect herself because she doesn't want to get pregnant. She doesn't want to become a caregiver tomorrow. She wants to go live her best life. And he, being someone who wants to prosper, is saying, I need to spread my greatness. This is, this is literally, I do this podcast on Friday. It's called Pivot. And the, we did all this consumer research, and it came back with the reason we like listening to Scott is it's like a NASCAR race where we think there could be a fiery crash at any moment. <laughs> this, like, my answer is like a one in 10 chance I'll be fired from NYU. <laughs> Males and females. You said we, take outsized risk if you want to be go. happy. Okay, thank I mean, you. Wait. Thank you. Anyways, I, so this, I don't know if this has to do with happiness, but look, males have two jobs. Their first job is to survive. Their second job is to spread their seed to the four corners of the earth. The majority of men in this room would sleep with the majority of the women. The women would sleep with almost none of the men in this room. <laughs> Women's, women have two jobs. Their first job is to survive. Their second is to put a, a much finer filter and base all the seed trying to get everywhere, pick the smartest, strongest, and fastest seed. It's the reason why your kids will be taller than you. It's the reason my kids will be less prone to infection than me. That is the basis of evolutionary progress. It's the reason why guys will spend money to try and look 53 again, and women will wear ergonomically impossible shoes. This is the basis, this is the chocolate and peanut butter of evolutionary progress. I have no idea how we got here. How did we get here? Anyways, what Prosperity. was the question? Prosperity? Prosperity. Okay, look. I'm trying to, I want you to take prosperity and, and take it down so we can understand where it actually sits in our lives. Well, look, I, I think that the, the early years around you know, sexual selection and mating are incredibly important. I think your instincts kick in, but I think we are an evolved species, and I think we can be more thoughtful around what creates long-term happiness. And there are, there's some research showing that some of the indicators around happiness, open and honest conversations around values, around money, will extend the likelihood that you won't have something economically ruinous and emotionally, I have personal experience with this. My parents were pulled out of school when they were 13. They were immigrants, came to this country. My father was a salesman, my mother a secretary. But they strung together this wonderful upper middle class lifestyle. And we managed 
to again take advantage of this other incredible innovation credit, and we bought a, a house, or they bought a house, in Laguna Niguel. And if you stood on your toes in live, the living room, you could see the ocean. We had an ocean view home in Laguna Niguel. And my, I was thriving. I was in the third grade. I was doing great in Little League. I loved school. And my dad fucked up. My dad started his third marriage while his second marriage was going on. And within six months, we were all living in shitty apartments. And nobody was the same for like 10 years. So my, I think it's important as a young person, when you decide to try and commit to somebody, that you have very open and honest conversations around what your expectations are and your approach to this type of stuff. And we don't like to have these conversations because they're, they're uncomfortable, or we don't think that way when we're young. We think like you're talking about, he's cool, she's hot, let's hook up, okay, we're 27, everyone's getting married, so maybe we should. That's how I slept walk through my 20s. Oh, everyone else is getting married, so I, that means I must get married, and she's, you know, she's wonderful, and she seems to like me. That was literally the basis of my conversation around mating in my 20s. So I think we should have a more thoughtful conversation. I wish a lot of the young people I counsel, I have this cottage industry kind of counseling the young men of my friends, or the, 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 boy, the sons of my friends, because relatively speaking, relative to other cohorts, young men have lost more ground against any other cohort in the US. It's probably about time, but there are young men are failing on almost every index. Something like 40 to 60% of men will live with their parents before the age of 25 again. They're not graduating college. 70% of high school valedictorians are girls. All of these things are great on Why some level. Hold on. Yep. Why does that mean that they're failing? That they're failing? But, but it, right? Before now, those girls didn't necessarily have the opportunities, right? And it go, but that goes into this narrative that, you know, there's this war against men and women are out to get them. No, maybe women just finally yep. have a shot in the game. There's some wonderful things happening, but there's just no getting around it. I think a lot of young men are failing. I think that they don't, I think they have become expectant. I think there was, generally they watch their dads and they believe that because they're white and they have outdoor plumbing that they're entitled to a certain, lo a certain life. And that's just not true. I don't think they bring the same level of grit, the same level of discipline, the same level of maturity as some of their female counterparts. And I think young men, on almost any level, if you really look at the, the data, are failing. So the question is, as a young man, I, I, when I sit down and I talk to my friend's boys, I ask a series of questions. Substances, right? What is the role that substances play in your life? And this is one of my equations. When I lived in New York, I used to go out, and I was learning from Morgan Stanley, I used to go out every night and come downtown to a cool club and get shitty drunk with what felt like other successful people. And I wasn't an addict, I was quite productive. I was making a lot of money, I was working at Morgan Stanley. So I wasn't an alcoholic. People, young people think that addiction is the litmus test, am I living under a bridge or am I a failure or have I had an intervention? If not, then, it, then whatever I'm doing seems to work. And that's not the right question. The right question is, would you be a little bit better at a lot of things if you were less dependent upon alcohol or cut down alcohol, cut down cannabis, cut down television, cut down trans fats, whatever it might be? I was a, I was a, a, a lesser investment banker. My relationships weren't as strong. I wasn't physically as strong as I should have been because I was just drinking too much. And one of the things I tell the kids is, look at every substance in your life and just imagine dialing it back by two-thirds. Maybe you're not an addict. Maybe you're not physically addicted to it. But if you dialed it back by two-thirds, what would happen to the other components of your life? So anyways, uh, I think substances and an open and honest conversation with yourself about the role substances play, even if you're not addicted to them, is a worthwhile conversation in your 20s. It's one I'd wished I'd had earlier. Then would you equate happiness with peace? Contentment? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I think everybody has their own kind of chi or contentment. Some people get rewards in different areas. And again, I don't think there's any one. I'm not comfortable. Then maybe this what is I'm the, getting at is the one thing. Do, do we misunderstand based on your metrics? Yeah. Based on the equations, are, are we incorrectly defining happiness? And what I mean is, we often connect it to something like joy. Yeah. And joy is not, I wouldn't put joy next to any of the things that you just described. Yeah. But when you talk about happiness, 
a lot of those other words I equate with being centered and peaceful. So happiness is oftentimes a sensation. There was a great article by David Brooks in the New York Times about this. And it's oftentimes happiness is in the context of an achievement yourself. Joy, real joy, is usually accomplished in the context of accomplishments with others. You feel joy. You're, there's, it's striking how much joy is happening out there right now. It's not happiness. It's joy, right? When you're at your kid's graduation, it's joy. You're in the company. We, as a species, are typically happiest when we're in the company of others and in motion. I think that's why SoulCycle and CrossFit are so successful. But if you talk to seniors, if you talk to people as they're about to die and you ask them for their memories, their most important memories, it's usually when they're surrounded by others in motion. Specifically, remember when we all went to the Vatican in Rome as a family and what a jerk Johnny was being? People remember their family vacations. They remember being outside, in motion, in the context or in the company of other people they love. They feel a, a level of satisfaction. The other, one of the other key components. But that's also because real time, the memory of family experiences or parenting is much better than the real time experience. We, we, we put Vaseline over the lens. Yeah. No doubt, but who cares? <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna do a shit ton of heroin before I die. And as long as I feel good, you know, I think, I think it'll be worthwhile. Um, I thought that'd be funnier. Anyways, <laughs> another key component, another key component that came up in all the research, people who had very healthy relationships. So what's the secret sauce? If there's one best practice, it's a number of deep and meaningful relationships. That's where the happiest cohort over index. And what is one critical attribute of people who over the course of their life had a lot of very healthy, deep, meaningful relationships, what was present in that person? Where did they over-index? They were more forgiving. If you don't bring a certain level of forgiveness or a predisposition to forgiveness, it's going to be difficult to sustain long-term relationships because you and your partner will screw up. You and your friends will take advantage or not appreciate the friendship as much as they should at certain times. You will suffer injustices. They will not do you, know, do you right sometimes. If you do not bring forgiveness to a relationship, you are not going to have a lot of long, meaningful ones. The other thing that has to do with forgiveness, again, around the this, this same survey of seniors, what is the one thing, the one piece of advice they would give to themselves? What is the one thing they wish they changed? It's not, oh, I wish I'd made more money, or I wish I hadn't gotten divorced, or I wish I'd been close to my parents. They wish they had been less hard on themselves. And it goes back to one of these equations, and that is nothing is ever as good or as bad as it seems in the moment. Nothing is ever as good or as bad as it seems. In 1999, I thought it was done economically. I was, Credit Suisse was taking my firm red envelope public. I was gonna run for Congress. I was gonna give hundreds of millions of dollars away and just be awesome the rest of my life. And by 2000, the market corrected that in a very aggressive way. And then by 2008, I got run over by the recession, and my oldest son had the bad judgment to come rotating out of my girlfriend, and I was 40 and felt like a total loser, that I was economically strained, had a son, and didn't, I mean, it was emasculating. It was, and I remember thinking, nothing is ever as good or as bad as it seems. I wasn't the genius I thought I was in 99, but I wasn't the idiot that I thought I was in 2008. And what most old people tell their younger selves is, Look back, the things where you really beat yourself up on, where you really think you screwed up, they look back and they go, you know what? It just wasn't that meaningful. It wasn't that big a deal. And at the same time, when you're out there and you kill it, and you get promoted, or you're a genius in terms of your stock, so you make some money, or you're the man or the woman for that day, also realize that's not entirely your fault, and that there's a regression to the mean. Nothing is ever as good or as bad as it seems. And that's been very helpful to me. I, as I get older, I get anxious. I was at a board meeting last week, and I said the most stupid fucking things, and I made everything worse for everybody. And I'm like walked out of there, and I was sitting, staring at the ceiling that night, going, God, I'm just terrible at this. I'm beating myself up, and it's just a chocolate mess. Like, just a chocolate mess. Like, so pissed off and upset at myself. And what helps me get through those moments as I know, at the end of my life, I'm going to look back and, yeah, that was a stupid thing to say. Who cares? Move on. Nothing is ever as good or as bad as it seems. Then where is the, explain to me, blind ambition, right? And people are 
striving, grinding, pulling to be more and more successful. How come while we're in that climb, yep. or traditionally, we're not reminded or we don't talk about the importance of deep and meaningful relationships or love and affirmation, right? When, when Harvey Weinstein went down, he went down because of issues related to sex. But suddenly everyone started talking and said he was an awful monster. He was a brutal leader. And we've heard about this more and more people in, in senior positions, not so much in 2019, but historically. Mm -hmm. You've actually seen a correlation between hugely successful people who are awful and awful to those around them. Well, look, it, it, uh, some of the things you're talking about, like, verge into criminal behavior. Um, I don't mean that, but... Yeah, so, look, uh, the... Today, we, we're saying that, you know, you, being empathetic is really important, but for years, it wasn't. So I'm trying to connect sort of ambition with love, you know, the, the, the desire for love and affirmation, because traditionally, I don't think people equate them. But the, one, the wonderful thing about academia is we are told to pursue the truth regardless of who it offends. And there's some fantastic research now. That's what tenure gives you. Yeah, I, I'm not tenured, <laughs> by the way. I can be fired at any moment. Um, uh, uh, that's why I have 180 kids in my class, because I actually have to show up and do the work. Anyway, uh, I could get fired for that, probably. Anyways, the, the notion that as you get older, look, being, being, I think that there's a ton of great research out there showing that the most successful leaders are empathetic, that the people who are happiest are constantly grateful. I mean, there's now all this research showing that not only should you be grateful, but you should cement it in your brain by writing it down um, every night, that that's a trick for happiness, that it literally releases a hormone and that you're, that you're, more, um, that you're more grateful. So I think there's a lot of hacks. I think there's a lot of great research out there. I think every year we get a little bit more conscious of these things. You know what, I mean, let's talk about meteors. We talked about divorce taking people off track. There's other things that can take you off track. Um, I think the two most pre prevalent things are one with this cohort is always howling in the money storm. Because if, if we said to you in this room, what are your goals? You said in 20, if you said in 20 years, I want to have successful relationships, I want to be relevant professionally, I want to be healthy, I want to have people who love me, I want to love others. Almost all of you will achieve those things. Almost all of you will achieve those things. But you well, won't hold be. Hold on a, a second. No? That's a heady list. Do you really think that? At a certain level, I bet everybody in this room, not everybody, I bet most of the people in this room have most of those things or will. I'm confident that you'll have those things. The hard part with an ambitious group of people. Can I drop one more time? Sure. Will they feel that they have those things? Well, that's the, that's the trick. The trick is because here's. One of the fantastic genes that's important to the evolution of the species is the competitiveness gene. And the competitiveness gene is really important. It makes you grasp beyond your reach. The downside to that is you typically will anchor off the most successful person you know in every category. Who got tenure before me? Who is always getting best teacher every year and has bigger classes than me? I'll sweat the motor. <laughs> who, is, who is richer than me? the majority of my friends in the hedge fund business who are more lucky than good, right? And you convince yourself that it's luck because if you accepted that it was good, then you would mean you were less than them. But you don't, but the problem is deep down you don't accept it. The, the deep down you feel inferior. That competitiveness gene can be very, very destructive. And the thing about money, howling in the money storm, is you know that scene in Star Wars where uh, uh, Luke, Hamill, uh, Luke, Luke Skywalker is trying to convince Han Solo to rescue Princess Leia? And he says, there'd be a lot of money in it for you. And he says, how much? And he says, more money than you could ever imagine. And Han Solo goes, I don't know, I can imagine a lot of money. <laughs> Even when you check those boxes, if you're in a capitalist society and you always have that income, you always have that number, it's very easy to imagine two, three, ten times that number. And you probably know of somebody who are following a lot of people on Instagram who have two five tens. So one of the meteors, one of the meteors is always howling in the money storm. The other meteor that can take you off track, and this is more for people of our generation, is if you have, you have your world of stuff, you have your world of sport, you have your world of kids. If something comes off the rails with one of your kids, you're literally your whole world goes away and it's just about the kids, full stop. You want to see perspective, you want to see how grateful and wonderful your life was yesterday, 
something goes wrong with your kid. And we have, in my opinion, and I'm parroting uh, the work of an outstanding colleague here, Jonathan Hyde, who wrote this very important book called The Coddling of the American Mind. We have an emerging mental health crisis among teens. Teen suicide among boys is up 30%. It's up 60 to 80% among girls for two reasons. One, we engage in this concierge bulldozer parenting where we use so many sanitary wipes on our kids' lives that they don't develop any requisite immunities when they face adversity. And two, we have these social media platforms and unfettered tech companies that have absolutely no regard, in my opinion, for the mental well-being of our youth, that have no regulation on them. And whereas there's fear of missing out, now teenagers see a party they're not invited to play out in real time alone in their room. So boys bully physically and verbally, girls bully relationally, and we have put nuclear weapons in the hands of young girls to bully relationally. We're seeing self-cutting and self-harm. We are, in my view, seeing an absolute epidemic of depression, which leads to opioid uh, overdoses and opioid addiction. Most people in this room could tell you where the Dow is today. Most people can't tell you where their PSA levels are, their cholesterol levels. We think the Dow, the Dow is the, literally the worst metric in the world. It is so damaging to America because it is effectively a measure on the economic well-being of the top 10% of households who own 80% of the stocks. And guess what? Spoiler alert, the top 10% are killing it. What's a better metric that nobody knows? For the last three years, for the first time in the history of this nation, our life expectancy is declining in this country. We've never had that happen before. Because more people will die this year of opioid over overdoses than died in the entire Vietnam conflict. Oh, but the Dow's hit new highs. Who cares? And I think part of that, I think that's going to get worse because of, unfortunately, trying to make our kids so physically safe we don't prepare them emotionally, and because we have tech platforms that aren't subject to the same standards as any other firm we've held accountable uh, in the history of business. So I think a huge source of unhappiness for people of our generation will be teen depression as brought on by this dangerous cocktail of overparenting and unfettered social media platforms. And then if you don't let your children use any of these platforms, then they're completely isolated because it's how young people communicate. We have, we're going to open up to questions. I just oh. want to flip the script. The oh. two or three elements or best practices for happiness in Stephanie Rule's life. What brings you happiness? Have you distilled it down to anything? Oh, um, honestly, uh, when I was young, so I was in investment banking for the first 15 years of my career. Um, the number one thing that has made me significantly happier in the last five years, I don't have long-term goals anymore. I used to have, I, my life was, was built on them, especially in banking, right? Like, I work for the worst person, and, and I'm getting treated horribly, but in a year, I'm going to get this. And if I do this, I'm going to get that. And, you know, where am I going to live, and how old are my kids going to be, and what is my husband going to look like? And then the end of the year comes, and the goalposts move because you didn't get promoted, or the person you worked for quit or got blown out. And, and you realize all of those years behind you that you were grinding, you were miserable. You didn't respect yourself. You treated the people closest to you who you love like shit. And so for me, honestly, it was wiping out my long-term goals and trying every day to say, I'm going to try to wake up happy, and I'm going to try to go to bed a little bit happier. And the best way I was able to do that was to have less sharp elbows. And I think that especially for women, when you go into really competitive industries, you know, we're little and we, not a lot of people look like us or sound like us. We believe we have to cut and be so sharp, right? And, and in order for me to succeed and be the most successful, other people can't be. But when you actually get mature about your ability, when you start to say, I know I'm pretty good at this, and you create a community, and you're not hoarding your business. When you hoard your business, it's exhausting. And you're trying to do things you're not that good at. But when you actually celebrate the people around you, and you're complimentary, and you make the environment positive, people will want to be near you. They'll actually choose to work with you, which might have a, a less successful team or a less successful group than others. Because if you create joy, like joy begets joy. Right? And, and then people want to work in your group, and they want to sleep with people in your group, and they want to go out. Yeah, I don't mean, you know what I mean? Like, if you create positivity, that, right? Like, I'm always even, the profane one. No, but, but, 
you know, even, right, and I'll, I'll just be quick. Yeah. There's even a huge difference between people having positive relationships at work and falling in love at work, which I think is totally normal. Yep. Right? I mean, you spend 80% of your time at work. You, you're, you have common interests uh, with your coworkers. You, you, you socialize together. It's normal yep. to, to eventually, right? It, it's the intimacy, and I don't mean the sex, but it's intimacy that's actually created amazing business ideas and relationships. But since Me Too has happened, and it, which is a great thing, but we're sanitizing things, harassment and relationships and love have nothing to do with one another. And like, I'll give an example, right? What people say Joe Biden did, and I'm not trying to be political, Joe Biden was giving people affection, saying, I care. When someone's harassing you, they're not trying to hug you. They're trying to assert power over you in a grotesque way. And so I actually think creating a loving environment as silly as it could be, and, and helping people makes a huge difference. And oftentimes, rich people think that they're generous. Oh, thank you. Oh. Oh my god, I got an applause and you didn't, like, holy shit, like, you must feel hard. I hate yourself. myself. Yes. I hate myself. But to be generous, to be generous, when a really rich person gives money away, yeah. Listen, I'll take their money for my charity, for my school, because I want it. That's not generosity. Generosity is giving something that costs something. Mm -hmm. And so when you see people do generous things every day, taking from themselves, I just think it's awesome. And if you make it, look at you. You moved to Florida. You, you, you're saying not all my businesses are successful, but you've prioritized being good, not being a dick. And we used to think that being successful was being, we, especially in, in, in areas like politics or banking, yeah. people connected being an asshole with being successful. You know why? Steve Jobs. Well, guess what? He's dead and Mark Benioff's alive. And you know what he is? Awesome. I agreed, but we had, and we'll open up to questions, the Jesus Christ, Christ of society has become less reliant on religion as they become more educated and wealthier but we still need super beings, and we decided that the super being and the Jesus Christ of an information economy was a guy who in court denied his own blood so he could avoid child support payments when he was worth a quarter of a billion dollars. I mean, it's just so obvious that we need more engaged fathers, not a better fucking phone. Let's open it up to questions. <laughs> Hopefully you can hear me. We can. Um, <laughs> Please introduce yourself. Uh, my name's Adam Anzoni. Um, do you think how much time you spend in the digital world affects how happy you are, and how do you manage that? Yeah, I do. And I think we're going to, there's an, an amazing uh, uh, researcher, a guy named Tristan Harris, uh, who you probably, you probably mm -hmm. know Tristan, who's done great work around this. I think we're just literally scratching the surface in terms of the negative and there's some positive things about social, but we're just, so this is my smoking. My mom and dad were addicted to smoking, it killed my mom. Twitter's my smoking. I know I'm gonna get a dope ahead, I wanna see, I need constant reaffirmation, I need rewards. I go on, I see my content, how many people love me, say nice things about me, and probably more importantly, I get people who don't like me and that enrages me, which keeps me checking this thing 40 to 50 times a day. But isn't that also why we always say, oh my goodness, those social media platforms, they're in trouble, they're having huge problems. They're not actually having any problems. Businesses because never we're been gonna stronger. shit talk Twitter all day long and then you're gonna check your Twitter account. Their businesses have never been stronger. But uh, I know it's bad for me. Uh, having a dopa thing in my pocket, I've started going to dinner. I can, I can modulate myself. I'm at least mature enough and I can read the research to know I have a problem and to do something about it. I worry my 11-year-old boy when he asked me to take a video of him doing a handstand, and then he says, can we upload it to YouTube, which we did. And then I start seeing him saying, we're at the beach, and he's like, can we go on and see if I got any likes? Because he got a like and a comment, and it gave him some dopa. Wow, well done, a handstand. And then someone else came up and said, you shouldn't be doing handstands, and that upset him. But all of a sudden, I saw the addiction starting to feedback and random rewards. And we're all addicted to feedback. I mean, these firms basically have taken slot machines and turned them into the supernova of the dopa you get right when the wheels come up. And actually, 
Another outstanding colleague, Adam Alter, wrote this fantastic book called Irresistible, The Rise of Addictive Technologies. I can modulate it. I'm worried that young people and teens can't modulate it, and we're going to find that we're raising a generation of chemically screwed up kids and young adults. Um, and that's even before you even get to the point where a foreign intelligence arm of a foreign government can weaponize these platforms because they're totally driven by economics and can basically pervert our elections. Or you have algorithms, you have profit engines that are run on rage. Because though we like to think we're nice people, we're fairly tribal and nothing creates engagement like enragement. Fairly so, nice doesn't work on social. I mean, it, it, there's some nice, so you get a lot of nice stuff, I get a lot of stuff, but when the clicks really, really go rampant and we get more Chobani ads and more shareholder value for Facebook and Instagram, is when they say something awful or controversial or they say, or they publish anti-vax content. That creates a ton of anger. More clicks, more Chobani ads, more earnings for Facebook. Whereas if you put out scientific research saying, no, in general, pretty much 100% of the time, societies that adopt vaccinations, the kids are healthier and the society is better off, that just doesn't stir up a lot of controversy or clicks or Chobani ads. So we have an underlying profit motive built into dividing and tearing at the fabric of our society. It's very dangerous. I went off script emotionally, I, and I think, it's, I think it's very damaging. Are you able to modulate, not just because you're an adult and he's a child, but are you able to modulate because you were raised without social media, so your self-worth, for the most part, is internal. And the highs and lows that you get from social media is like an add-on. We're raising kids in a digital era where their entire self-worth is based on likes. Could be, but aren't you? I, I don't know if you're this way. I get very bummed out or very excited by the feedback I get in social media. Of course, but I don't live and die by it because it didn't exist in my life for 40 years. So you, I, but that's our an children thesis. don't, I don't know, know the difference. I, I, don't, I, I don't know if, that, if we're less prone to it because we, we, we spend most of our lives without it. I don't, I don't know. That could be a bad thing, too. I don't know. Hi there, my name is Sanaz. By the way, a big fan of your podcast. Um, I was curious in the research around happiness, were there difference in other countries or was it all kind of the same themes, even globally? So it is interesting. So, okay, so the most recent study on happiness found that seven of the top 10 countries that were the happiest, they had one thing in common. Does anyone know what those one thing, that one thing was? Poverty. Healthcare. Socialism. <laughs> seven of the 10 happiest countries are socialist. And there's probably some noise in that data. But happiness is not only about what you have. It's an absence of fear from what can be taken away from you. In most socialist countries, what you have is you don't worry about going bankrupt because your wife's diagnosed with lung cancer. So the happiest countries tend to be socialist. There's also there's an arc of happiness across all economic classes, across all geographic boundaries, across all cultural boundaries. And you never see research this clean. And that is the arc of happiness through the course of your life is a smile. And that is kind of 0 to 25 is the stuff of Disneyland, Han Solo, fun times with your parents, you know, brother. You just look generally back on your childhood as being very happy. And then 25 to 45 is actually when you're least happiest. Why? It's what I call the shit gets real part of your life. You come to the discovery that you're probably not going to be senator or have a fragrance named after you. Someone. Someone you know and you love gets sick and dies. And that literally hits you square in the face. The harshness of life hits you square in the face. Kids are stressful. We don't like to talk about this, but there's a body of research out there showing that people without kids are generally happier than people with kids. People don't regret having them, think it's incredibly rewarding. And to your point, you tend to have a bias and revisionist history about how wonderful it was to have kids, but having kids is really stressful. Well, Work it's about is stressful. Sacrifice. It's stressful. It's sacrifice. They get sick. You're up all night wondering about their croup. But then something wonderful happens. And about the time you hit 50, you're younger if you're soulful, you start getting happier. You start realizing that life is finite. You take stock of your blessings. If you live in America, you're, you probably have incredible blessings, in my view. And you start like, appreciating weird things. I used to go surfing because I thought it was fun and it made me seem more interesting. More interesting. <laughs> Now I do it, I can't get over how on earth a cylinder of several million tons of water forms 
and then I can write it on a piece of fiberglass. It just fascinates me. I never thought that way when I was 25. You start getting into nature. You start appreciating health. You start loving food more. You start appreciating friendships. You start realizing what an incredible invention academia is. I just didn't think that way when I was younger. Anyways, back, of course, back to me. But you get happier. So the advice to, to people in their 20s and 30s when they face adversity and they're in a point in their life where like, I'm not as happy as I thought I was going to be. That is entirely normal. That is part of the journey. And the key is to keep on keeping on that happiness awaits for you. Just quickly before we go to the next question, you had said, and chances are, you know, you, 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 you live in the United States, so you have all these blessings. So isn't this interesting? The happiest countries, yeah. for the most part, are countries with socialism. Yeah. Yet in this... In, in your last answer, you said, and you're, Amer you know, you're Americans, so you have all these blessings. We're less happy. So yep. we have the blessings, but we're less happy than those who don't. Yeah, I just, uh, I, don't, I can't, that's what the research says. I, um, I'm just speaking personally. Um, State-funded education, so, you know, key component is being grateful. I'm here on the stage with you because of the generosity and vision of California taxpayers and, and the regents of the University of California. I went to UCLA and Berkeley, total tuition, $7,000, and live a life I would have never imagined because of big government and because America used to love unremarkable kids. I'm not, this isn't a humble And because of your mom. And because of my mom, thank you for that. And the irrational passion for my well-being and my mother. We used to, as a nation, and unfortunately I, don't, I think we've, there's never been a better time in our nation to be remarkable. The top 1% have never done better. If you were kind of middle of the road like I was, it's, ne it's never been a worse time. For the first time in our country's history, a 30-year-old isn't doing as well as his parents were at 30. Now, I think it's because we've fallen out. There's a very dangerous element in our society. I think we've fallen out of love with the unremarkables. And that is, a, a, and there's some well, good things exciting. about that. they're not exciting. They're not, everybody loves a, 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 a story of the underprivileged and helping yeah. the underprivileged win. We love those stories. And we love the remarkable stories, but all of those people in the middle are just not that cool. Yeah, there's a... They there's don't get a, that many likes. There's a weird... There's a... 100%. And there's some wonderful things in our economy. If you're a kid from an impoverished neighborhood and you've done really well, Harvard will find you and you can find Harvard. There's some amazing things about our economy right now. But what if you're just average from a middle-class household now? You can't get into a UC campus. That's what I was. Mother was a secretary. I didn't have good grades, but I didn't test well either. And I got to go to a great school and have remarkable opportunities. No longer the case. So I think there are real issues. And we start talking about America. I don't know how we got here. But I think we have real problems in terms of the role that the education. Do you realize Stanford has triple the applicants that it did 30 years ago? And they haven't increased their freshman class by one seat. Harvard has a $38 billion endowment. And the admissions director brags every year that we could have doubled the freshman class and not sacrificed any inequality. And my viewpoint is, well, with $38 billion, why wouldn't you? So, and Because exclusivity is what we think gives people joy. We think we're luxury brands. We're not luxury brands. We're public servants. Anyway, thank you for the question. Hi. Um, Ricky Barron, and I took Professor Galloway's class back in 2013. Hi, Ricky. How are you? Good. Um, are you happy? I, I would say you've always been very honest, especially, you know, uh, in your lectures. But I think I've noticed uh, from reading your newsletter and um, listening to podcasts, I think you've become a little bit more vulnerable. And you talk about issues um, you know, related to your kids or even like fear of public speaking. I'm curious, one, if you know, this is a conscious decision you've made to be more vulnerable, if that's tied into the happiness equation, if that's, and you know, if you've seen the benefits of it. Uh, that's a generous question. So he's talking about one of my blogs was about speaking. I get panic attacks. Typically, I'm fine. I'm, I'm an outstanding speaker. <laughs> I'm outstanding. I agree. One of the best in the world. I get paid, I get paid more, you know, more than household income to go to Midtown and speak to a bunch of, you know, whatever, dudes that work for a hedge fund. And on a regular basis, I get a panic attack. And I feel like I'm going to throw up, pass out, wake up. I mean, I literally feel like I'm dying. And so Why? I, 
Imposter syndrome? I don't know. I think it might be imposter syndrome. And it's totally random. It's totally random. So I write about it. It helps writing about it. And I love the Mr. Rogers quote of true success is having nothing to fear. So I write a lot about insecurities. I write a lot about because here's the thing. The moment you write about this stuff, I had the CEO of one of the three largest content companies in the world say, so I'm coming downtown to meet with you. And he started talk I started talking about you know, my mom's death and how kind of I couldn't get past it and how I felt like as a, I like to think of myself as an alpha male master of the universe. And I realized like three years after my mom's death, I hadn't moved on with my life and I needed help. And this guy, I mean, this guy is a real master of the universe, calls me and says, I'm coming downtown. I didn't recognize his name. And he comes downtown, he brings a cup of coffee, and he just wants to talk about his mom's death. And what you realize is we're all struggling. We're all struggling at some point in, my, in, point in our life. And to be open and honest, you, get, you do get, you get wonderful um, support from other people. One of the keys, we talked about the ability to mourn and move on. I think when something bad happens to you, you literally need a clock. All right, I got fired. Feel sorry for yourself, hate yourself, be upset. You know, whatever it is, for two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, give yourself a time. And if you can't get past it, start thinking about reaching out to other people and saying, I'm having trouble. And I should have done that when my mom died. I should have said, OK, six, 12 months, I should kind of have my act back together. And I didn't. I think it's important. But it's, it's just amazing when you talk about this stuff. There is a world of empathy and support out there. So it's more self-preservation and also affirmation. People like it. People respond to it, so it's selfish in a lot of ways. You but said thank you for be the question. upset, but you didn't talk. You didn't say. You didn't talk about being ashamed. And when we get fired and we're ashamed, or what was the Mr. Rogers quote? S true success is not fearing the truth. So, when people feel shame, it's when they hide the truth. It's when they cover things up. Is when we think there's an ugly truth and we start lying. Yeah. So, is part of this starting to own ourselves and, and not believe there's an ugly truth. Just be exactly who you are. Yeah, but I mean, we all have secrets. I mean, it's, I, this is a tough one. But I find when you're out there with your emotion, here's another thing that I find with men. We believe being complimentary of, one of each other, men being complimentary of another man, that somehow your skills are a finite currency. And then if you say to a guy, I like your glasses, or you say to this guy, you have great hair, you're handsome, right? That somehow that makes my hair worse and I'm less handsome. What does that have to do with men versus women? If two men go to a party wearing the same sweater, they take a picture together. If two women are wearing the same dress, one is hiding under a table until the other one leaves. I find in general that women are more open with compliments of each other than men. That men are very rare, very, especially young men, typically don't. How many young men do you ever say to each other, I'm just so impressed by you? <laughs> I'm just so impressed by but you. But that's cultural homophobia. That is one, because it's a currency. I just made that term up. I'm just no, going to say that right it's there. Actually, I feel really good about it, it's too. It's true. We're taught, <laughs> we're taught I'm going to affection now. I was raised in a household where there was no affection. And I decided early on I was going to be overwhelmingly affectionate with my boys, because if you look at pack animals, and there's a ton of research around mammals, we, I co-sleep with my boys. They st everyone starts in their own bed. It turns into musical chairs around 3 AM. And then I usually end up with a 40-pound bow tie, which is my youngest, across my neck, who's just decided he wants to sleep across my neck. And Americans are really weird about co-sleeping. And actually, in Japan, it's very accepted. In India, it's very accepted. I think it's natural as mammals for us to be constantly touching each other. So I decided I was going to take affection, affection back and be really affectionate with my boys. I'm trying to be affectionate with my male friends, and it is not easy. <laughs> it is not easy. And you know what? A lot of it comes back to what you were saying. When I was young, you were told that if you were affectionate with other men, it was a sign of homosexuality. And when I was growing up, that was not cool. That meant there was something wrong with you. So we all put on this kind of masculine, testosterone-filled barrier between affection you know, affection meant one of two things. It was either a path to sex or it meant you were a homosexual. That's it. Any other affection, that's all affection was. And so I think my generation of males lost one of what is one of the most wonderful thing, things for our species, and that is affection 
that is not sexual. You know, affection. Um, human know, I'm doing contact. a lot of virtue signaling right now. I'm sorry? No, human contact. 100%. Thank you for the question. Yes? Hi, Kira Halevi, um, former student of Professor Galloway's. How are you? Great. I have um, three children, all boys. The conversation around the crisis that young men and boys are facing resonated. And I'm wondering, what do you think people like me can do to have an impact in reversing some of those trends um, that we discussed? So I, I don't. I, I, when I'm talking about this topic, I like it when people introduce me with my name as a poster professor, because I am not clinically trained in these issues. I have no academic credibility. Um, which didn't stop me from writing a book. But <laughs> this is what I tell young men. And it's, it's kind of do as I say, not as I do. I think in, embracing your gender is incredibly rewarding. And we're having this important conversation about how gender is a continuum. And unfortunately, because of some criminal acts and power uh, corruption and power and a workplace that wallpapered over all this incredibly bad behavior, we have conflated masculinity with toxicity. Masculinity is a wonderful thing. I think femininity is a wonderful thing. But a big part of my rap when I'm speaking to these, and these aren't boys, I'm speaking to young men typically, and I don't feel like I have any background or, or real domain expertise in child psychology, but what I can tell you when I'm meeting with young men is that don't, when I was young, embracing masculinity for me was generally being ripped I didn't go to the gym to get fit. I went to be huge, <laughs> right? I wanted to just be ridiculously big. I mean, it's instinctive, right? You should be able, as a male, to either kill someone or outrun them. <laughs> One of those two things, right? That's built into us. Two, I wanted to have sex with as many strange women as possible. And three, I wanted to be generally awesome. That's why I took a job at an investment bank. I had no idea what investment banking was. Literally, no idea, but I Me thought- too. Awesome. I want to be awesome. And my roommate wanted it, so I thought if he wants it, I'll do it, because I was very competitive with him. Those were my vines. And what I tell young men is, masculinity is awesome, but define your vines. My vines have changed as I've gotten older. You know what makes me feel masculine? Voting. I'm getting involved in the election. I'm signing up. I feel I'm so into you now. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Voting. Voting. Being a good neighbor. Chicks and I realize, so I realize I'm doing the mother of all virtue signaling right now. I have a neighbor who's sick. I took my kids over the other day. Being a good neighbor, being a responsible citizen, taking an, an interest in the, a child that's not yours, those make me feel strong like bull. So what young men should do is define what your vines are. And in sum, don't do what I do. Don't be a boy in a man's body. Get to the man part as quickly as possible. Masculinity is wonderful. It's wonderful. But define it early as a man and say, this is what I'm committed to. This is how I define my masculinity. I think it means being aggressive. Let me say something that gets a lot of controversy in the book. Take economic responsibility for your household as a man. Take responsibility. And by the way, sometimes taking responsibility is realizing that your partner is better at that whole money thing than you and being more supportive of that in the home. You know, my partner that I had kids with had a job at Goldman Sachs and was making more money than me at 10 years ago. I said, okay, I'll stay at home with the kids in the morning, which I hated, which and I hated. And society hated you doing it as well. But there's, anyways, my point is masculinity is a wonderful thing. We've just, for some reason, conflated it with terrible behavior. My behavior as a young man was what I would call being, like, what I call a boyish masculinity. But I think a conversation with young men of saying, what is masculinity? What does it mean to you? And get to those vines as quickly as possible. Thank you for the question. They're kicking us out. Well, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Let's hear it for Scott again. Thank you, Scott and Stephanie, for this thought-provoking conversation this evening. On behalf of Stern, I would like to give you a small token of our appreciation.
I would also like to extend a thank you to each one of you for your continued involvement with the NYU community. We will now move to the patrons lobby for the cocktail reception where the books have been provided graciously by Scott to each one of you for free and uh, they will be available to be signed by Scott as well. Thank you very much and have a great evening.